Hello, I'm Ollie and this is Crimin Ollie where I talk about crime, pulp, horror, that kind of thing. Today, all of the above, um, I'm going to tell you what I think are the 30 most influential popular novels of the last 50 years. Right, so I'm going to try and get through this as quickly as I can. Um, so it will be a whistle-stop tour. So for each book, I'm going to tell you um, what the book is, who it was by, when it was first published, um, and what about it I think is influential. Um, and I would start all of this by saying that this is only my view. So I am coming to this um, as a, um, a middle-aged white guy who likes reading, um, you know, thrillers and crime novels and horror novels and things like that. So I am very aware that I have many blind spots. Um, and I'm doing this really to to start the conversation, um, as I do with my videos on a Sunday. I'm starting the conversation. I definitely don't consider this to be a definitive list. So please do fill in the gaps, either in the comments or in response videos if you're a booktuber. Um, I'm really interested to, to see what people think about this. Um, and the reason I'm doing it is, you know, anyone who's watched the channel at all will know that I, A, I love popular fiction, and B, I think popular fiction is really important because of the impact it has on, on culture and on our society. So all of these books are books that have shaped the kind of entertainment that we have more broadly. Um, so, you know, partly the kind of entertainment we have in literature, but also, you know, in some cases more broadly than that, they've spilled out into other forms of entertainment. And I think they have all had an impact on... Um, you know, modern Western society um, and, you know, on our views and things like that, as well as just the stuff we consume. Um, you know, that may be more true in some cases than others, but I think to an extent it's probably true of everything here. Um, so, yeah, this is my this is my top 30. Like I say, it's not definitive. Um, this is a list to be added to and amended. You know, if I think I've if you think I've made any terrible decisions in this list, um, then do please tell me. Uh, but it was quite fun pulling it together. Um, so as I say, it's over the last 50 years. So the first year is 1972. Uh, and I'm going to list these books um, in order. OK, right, let's go. So the first book is The Terminal Man by Michael Crichton um, from 1972. So Crichton is, I think, a really important author um, in terms of you know modern entertainment. So he really nailed... Um, the the form of having thrillers that had science in them but weren't really science fiction if that makes sense so you think about something like Jurassic Park um, the Andromeda Strain which is you know one of his earlier books um, the Terminal Man is about um, a, a guy who's epileptic um, who has like a computer embedded in his brain um, so it's really that kind of sciencey stuff which is so much part of modern blockbuster entertainment um, but pre Crichton, you know, was was much less prevalent. Um, book two, also from 1972, is Death Wish by Brian Garfield. So, you know, very famous for the movie that was based on it. But really one of those books that kick started our fascination with the, the vigilante, which I think in many ways, I think it's a, a throwback to kind of cowboy movies. So in a way, I, I consider Death Wish to be a modern Western Um but, you know, really tapped into that feeling at the time. And, and that has persisted since then, that the justice system was, you know, was letting the ordinary members of the public down um, and was favouring criminals and that it was, um, you know, not, not necessarily justifiable, but there, there might be reasons why someone would take the law into their own hands. So I think it's a really American thing, um, particularly with that, you know, the fascination with with guns and, and you know, weapons that, um, that exists in modern America. Um, as I say, I think it's got throwbacks to the Western, but definitely kind of set the set the scene and set the standard for a new type of uh, a new type of thriller um, in the second or the, the latter part of the 20th century. Um, OK, next up, kind of similar in a way, I guess. So First Blood by David Morrell, the, um, the book that created the character of Rambo and, and launched him into an unsuspecting world. Um, so I think this is an important book, not just because of the action, but also because of its kind of cynicism and the, the sense that you get in this book, which isn't, you know, it's captured to an extent in the, in the movie version, but, you know, f completely lacking in later movies um, in the Rambo series. But this sense of disaffection in, you know, young Americans 
um, and the clash between the generations in America. So, you know, the book is very much around Rambo, who's a young man who's just back from the war, um, battling against, you know, midtown, um, middle class, middle aged America in the form of the sheriff. Um, and I think that's a theme that has come back, you know, again and again subsequently. Um, OK, next up, something from the UK. So The Rats by James Herbert. Um, again, from 19, uh, this one, sorry, from 1974. So I've talked about this book on the channel before. I really consider Herbert and, and this particular book to have kick-started the, um, you know, the late 20th century British horror boom. Um, so, you know, The Rats was completely different from any book that had come before it. Um, it's horrible. It's, you know, deliberately grisly. It's very grim in places. It's quite political in places. It feels to me like, a, you know, one of the first punk rock horror novels. Um, it's, you know, and, and it's fantastically gory and it was sold to the public, um, you know, on that basis that it was a really gory, violent book. Um, and that, I think, was something new and something that has persisted since. I think it's a really important book in the in the modern horror genre. Um, next up, more horror, also from 1974. So Carrie by Stephen King. Um, so why is this one important? Well, a, it was Stephen King's first novel. And, you know, Stephen King casts a massive shadow over modern popular fiction. Um, but also because um, I think it's it's one of those books that so many of King's themes, which have become, you know, recurrent themes in other parts of popular culture, um, are present in Carrie. So you've got, you know, you've kind of got bullying. Um, you've got um, a kind of a pr oppressive religious parents um, and you've got the the horror element woven very much into an, an everyday story. So, you know, at its heart, Carrie is a story about a teenage girl who's unhappy at high school, which is, you know, a, a, a story that is told again and again um, in, you know, in the late 20th century and, in, and into the 21st century as well. Um, Carrie obviously puts a horror spin on it. Um, but I think if you even if you took the horror away, it's a, if you you know if you take the horror away, sorry, it's a very typical story. Um, so yeah, I think you know very 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 influential book and you know fantastic movie as well. Um, next up, also from nineteen seventy four, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy by John Le Carre. So I think Le Carre is really important in shaping espionage fiction and movies in the modern world. So he has that a that sense of um, verisimilitude so you really feel like um he's he's nailed it and his his books are accurate um but also again in his kind of cynicism about the way these grand structures of of you know the intelligence agents and agencies and things like that work so you know there's a real cynicism about how government works in his work um and this was you know probably his first really big book um Right, moving on. So another thriller, again from the UK. Um, this one from 1975, The Eagle Has Landed by Jack Higgins. So this is more of a traditional thriller, um, but I think with a twist. So this is a Second World War story um, a group about a group of German soldiers who come to Britain um, and disguised as Englishmen um, attempt to assassinate Winston Churchill. And what I think is important about this is it comes after the, you know, the huge wake of um, Second World War stories that were written after the Second World War. So, you know, there's loads of stuff from the 50s and 60s that was more kind of either trying to be realistic or um, kind of more jingoistic um, action type stuff about the Second World War that almost, you know, reveled in the Allies' success. Whereas um, The Eagles Landed is a, is a much subtler work. Um, the fact that you've got German characters kind of as heroes, I think, is is interesting. They're certainly not Nazis, I would say, um, but they are Germans. But, it, you know, it's that portrayal of German soldiers as, as ordinary people um, rather than as monsters, um, you know, which I think up until that point had been quite prevalent in uh, in, in war fiction. Um, it's a cracking story as well, really entertaining and thrilling read. Um, right, next up, a bit of horror. Um, so from 1976, Interview with the Vampire by Anne Rice. So, um, I, you know, I think this book can be credited really with um, setting the scene and creating the tone of modern vampire fiction. Um, so, you know, things like the Suki Stackhouse books, I think definitely a huge debt to Interview with the Vampire and, and all the, you know, Twilight and all that kind of thing. You know, the way we think about vampires now in in our modern society, I think is completely down to, to Anne Rice's book. OK, moving on, a bit of crime. So from 1976, 
Um, the Sins of the Fathers by uh, Lawrence Block, which is the first of the Matt Scudder books. Um, so again, I think I, I think this is kind of a bit of a reinvention of the PI genre. So following on from things like Philip Marlowe um, and Mickey Spillane and people like that, um, Lawrence Block created a character in Matt Scudder, his hero, who was utterly fallible um, in a way that, you know, most previous detectives had not been. Um, you know, he's a fascinating character. And the other thing that, that Scudder uh, has, in you know, that, that exists in the, in the Matt Scudder books, which is much less prevalent, I think, in previous detective fiction, is an ongoing story arc. And in, in the case of Matt Scudder, it's about his battles with alcoholism. So, you know, he is an alcoholic, you know, in, the, in well, in, in all of the books, but in some of the books, he is a recovering alcoholic rather than a drinking alcoholic. And you really follow that journey with him. So there is a, you know, there, there's a sense of this overarching story of a man's life in, in the Matt Scudder books that you don't get in, you know, like Philip Marlowe or something like that. Um, OK, next up, our first fantasy book um, in the series. So um, Lord Fowl's Bane by Stephen Donaldson from 1977. And again, I think this is a, a reinvention of the fantasy genre as something more modern. Um, so it's much darker than a lot of fantasy that had gone before it. Um, you know, the the hero of these books is a pretty horrible character in many ways. Um, and it, and yet it draws on, you know, the kind of Tolkien-esque um, kind of fantasy worlds and things like that. So it definitely got a tie back to previous fantasy stories, um, but told with a very modern, um, well, modern for the 70s, but I think one that still resonates. And I think um, we still see that kind of, darkness in the fantasy that we read now that you know was was much less prevalent in the past um, and it also ties back to the kind of Edgar Rice Burroughs Barsoom type things of having um, you know a, a character from our world traveling to a fantasy world um, but as I say with a with a much darker edge than um, than a lot of previous books okay next up from 1978 another Stephen King book so The Stand by Stephen King um, I've chosen this one not because it's post-apocalyptic, although I think that's important, um, but clearly there were many post-apocalyptic books before this. Um, I've chosen it because it's so damn long. And I think um, the fact that it was such a huge success, and I think I'm right in saying that when it came out, it was King's most successful book to date. Um, I think it, it proved to publishers that really long books could be hugely successful and I think that had been true in other genres before so things like um, you know like family sagas and you know historical novels so I'm thinking of kind of James Michener and people like that um, but hadn't been true in you know for, for horror fiction um, and I think King you know absolutely nailed it with the stand you know the version that was originally published w was cut down because the publishers were nervous and clearly you know later on he ended up writing much longer books and and also you know rewriting and publishing the, the full uncut version of the stand so I think you know I think it set the scene for um, horror fiction and, and you know a broader range of popular fiction being much longer than it had been in the past okay next up um, something completely different with this one, actually. So this is um, Tales of the City um, by Armistead Moppen from 1978. So if you've not read the Tales of the City books, they're, they're fantastic. So the stories were originally serialised in, I think, the San Francisco Chronicle, I want to say. One of the, certainly one of the San Francisco newspapers. And they're about a boarding house in San Francisco that is populated by a variety of characters, many of whom are queer in some way, shape or form. Um, and it's, you know, one of the first, so certainly not one of the first LGBT books, but I think one of the first books where the, the, the gay status of the characters is almost incidental. It's at its heart, it's a book about people and about relationships and, you know, the start of a series that's a fun, entertaining, amusing, sometimes moving, but mostly a fun soap opera um, about people's lives. Um, and I think it has... I, th I think it changed the way gay people and, you know, lesbians and transgender people and, you know, the, the whole spectrum of, of LGBT um, types of people. I think it changed the way that they were portrayed in fiction from being something where being gay had been a very personal thing um, and, and often a traumatic or problematic thing to something where it was just, you know, part of life. OK, next up. Uh, 
something from the UK again. Um, so A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams from 1979. So, you know, clearly a, a massively well-loved book. Um, but also, I think, one that for the first time, and not that, so certainly not the first time humour had been injected into science fiction, but I think probably the first time it had been injected into science fiction and, and that book then, you know, took off massively. So a hugely successful book, hugely successful series, you know, originally a radio show, but then there was a TV show which was very successful. Um, there was a video games, there's been, you know, the, the more recent movie. Um, and I think it... it has that kind of playfulness um, that makes science fiction more accessible. Um, so I think there's, you know, so many wonderful jokes and things like that. But I think all of that pulls people into the sci-fi. So they're almost absorbing the sci-fi without realising it. Um, so, I, you know, a wonderful series of books, much loved by me. My dad, you know, is a huge fan of them. Uh, and I was really brought up on them. In fact, Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy was one of the first adult novels I read. Um, but I think they have continued to be really influential in, you know, in comedy as well as in science fiction. Uh, and I'm thinking about, you know, TV shows like Spaced and things like that, as well as, um, you know, as well as harder sci-fi. OK, next up, something a bit more action-y. So The Bourne Identity by Robert Ludlum from 1980. Um, and, and this, I think, is, you know, I've talked about... Um, John le Carré being the kind of sensible, serious, realistic side of espionage fiction. Um, I think The Bourne Identity, taking a leaf out of the James Bond book, really, um, injects a bit more fun uh, and action and drama into the, into the whole thing. So it's, a, it's much more colourful and much less stale than... Uh, not I'm saying Le Carré's stale, I think he's a fantastic writer, but his books are quite grey, shall we say, whereas The Bourne Identity is just a silly thriller. Um, and also, you know, one of the first things that has that um, amnesiac hero kind of trope, which has become really common since then. Um, so two, two, in two ways, I think it's a, a really important um, book. And, you know, the first of a series, which is still going, you know, written by someone else now. Um, but, yeah, fantastically enjoyable book. Um, and, you know, there was a movie at the time with, I think, Richard Chamberlain. Um, obviously, more recently, the Matt Damon films have been, um, you know, been really popular. But I think, you know, beyond the movies that are based on the book, it's just had an influence on um, on action cinema and also on the thriller genre generally. Um, in terms of, you know, that lone hero with everyone against him um, is, you know, has become a, a real mainstay of, uh, of of popular fiction. OK, next up, um, a bit of horror. Well, is it horror? I don't know. I don't, I'm never sure if these books are really horror or crime or thrillers, but Red Dragon by um, Thomas Harris. So the first of the Hannibal Lecter books, I think the best of the Hannibal Lecter books, although I do really like the book of uh, Silence of the Lambs as well. Um, and, you know, one of the first true modern serial killer novels. So this, you know, the, the success of this book and, and probably more particularly Science of the Lambs really set the scene and, and uh, gave a kickstart to the serial killer genre, um, which, you know, in the 90s was huge. Um, there were so many serial killer books and movies in the 90s. You could, you know, you really couldn't move for them. And I think that is mostly down to the, the success of Thomas Harris's books, um, which, you know, which are great books. But, you know, the serial killer prior to that, you know, you had things like Psycho, um, you had Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but not the kind of um, more forensic style of serial killer novel um, where... Um, you know, it's about the investigation, but also the psychology of the serial killer is, is really at the forefront. Um, OK, next up, some science fiction. So from 1984, Neuromancer um, by William Gibson. So, you know, the book that invented the term cyberspace. Um, I think, you know, it had a massive influence on, on many things that came after it, you know, in particular, like, the you know, the Matrix trilogy. Um, but just a hugely influential book in the science fiction genre, you know, and more broadly, it it you know it came out at a time before, um, you know, the internet had had taken off really at all as a, um, you know, a, a popular thing that was consumed by you know the general public, um, but really started to shape our thinking about the internet. Um, and how it could be used. And, you know, many of the things that are talked about in, in Euromancer are, are things that are happening now. Um, and it was, you know, it was written 40, nearly 40 years ago. OK, next up, um, a another thriller, a quite a traditional thriller, 
Um, the Hunt for Red October uh, by Tom Clancy, also from 1984. So I think this is important because it really set the scene for modern um, kind of geopolitical techno thrillers. So all the previous thrillers I've talked about here have been, you know, relatively small scale. They tend to focus in on um, on individuals and things like that, rather than the grander scheme of things. What Clancy does so well in this and in, in his other books as well is, you know, look at that macro view of what's going on in the world um, and how all the different parts impact each other. And I think that's really, in many ways, shaped our thinking about politics and warfare and things like that in the modern world. I think, you know, Clancy is in some ways a bit of a hack um, as, a, you know, as a writer, but I think his ideas and the background he puts into his books is really important and, you know, was a, a huge part of the reason why they were so successful um, and has, you know, it has influenced movies uh, as well as books since then. OK, uh, next up, uh, the first, uh, uh, not the, yeah, not the only, but the first comic on the book on the list, um, The Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller from 1986. So I did think about um, using Watchmen for this, but I think The Dark Knight Returns was published slightly earlier than uh, Watchmen. I might be wrong in that. I think it was slightly earlier and really one of those comics that kickstarted the whole graphic novel revolution and also started us started more broadly than just comic fans people starting to think about um superheroes in a different way um and i think you know without the success of the dark knight returns and subsequent graphic novels you know that the dominance of of marvel in the movie industry today may not have happened um so again adding that kind of extra darkness and cynicism to to comic books um you know really struck a chord with with readers at the time um, and, you know, was the start of something much bigger. Um, next up, another comic. So Sandman um, by Neil Gaiman. So, uh, you know, another fantastically influential comic book series. And one that I think really set the scene for um, a kind of a kind of rebirth of, of the goth sensibility in, you know, in fiction and cinema in particular. Um, so it's something that that kind of moody darkness um, that is quite common um, in, you know, in cinema in particular now, but also in like YA fiction, um, I think owes a debt to Sandman. Um, I think it's a great, you know, a great comic book series, um, which blends, you know, kind of the metaphysical with the everyday in a really wonderful way. Um, but it's that goth sensibility that I think, you know, really shines through from it. Um, and has proven to be influential over the subsequent decades. Um, something completely different next. So The Firm by John Grisham. Um, so the first of Grisham's novels and a book that, you know, reinvigorated people's interest in the courtroom drama and in lawyers um, and made lawyers sexy in a way that they, you know, they hadn't been previously. So, um, you know, this the, the Firm came out in 1991. And if you think about how lawyers tended to be portrayed in, you know, like the 80s in particular, it's all about, you know, kind of people suing each other and litigation and stuff like that. And lawyers were, you know, particularly in the States, considered to be a bit of a, um, a stain on society. Um, I think Grisham, um, you know, created, well, it didn't create, but it reinvigorated this idea of the crusading lawyer, um, the lawyer taking down the bad guys rather than, um, you know, cops taking down the bad guys. And I think that's something that, you know, has, has persisted subsequently and that we see in a lot of, you know, TV shows and things like that in particular. So that the lawyer as hero um, is, is something that I think was reborn through John Grisham's books. Um, OK, next up, some horror. So The Ring by Koji Suzuki from Japan, which came out in 1991. Um, so this is the book on which the movie was based. Um, and I think um, this is one of those one of those books and the, and the movie does it, I think, even better than the book that, um, that it, it's that I don't know what you call it, that cursed art subgenre that has become so popular since then. Um, so the idea that there's this videotape that will curse you, that will you know lead to your death. And that's something we've seen played out again and again and again in, in movies in particular, but books as well um, since then. I think The Ring is still the, the pinnacle of it. It does it brilliantly. And despite the fact that in the book you don't see the videotape in the same way that you do in the movie, the book is still really effective um, and really, really creepy. 
Okay, next up, Welcome to Dead House, um, the first of the Goose, Goosebumps books by R.R. R. Stein. So uh, I was too old for Goosebumps when they came out. So this came out in 92. So I was 19 by then. So, you know, I was I was definitely not reading kids books um, anymore, although I have read some of the Goosebumps books subsequently. Um, I think Goosebumps, massively influential on a whole generation of readers. So, so many people I talk to in the in the horror community now got into reading because of the Goosebumps books and developed their love of horror because of the Goosebumps books. So, you know, they are cheesy. Um, they draw on, you know, stuff from the past and reuse it. But you, you cannot underestimate their influence on a generation of readers and, and horror fans. Um, I think, you know, modern horror owes a hell of a lot to the Goosebumps books. Um, OK, next up, Bridget Jones's Diary. So, again, something completely different. And like, um, and by Helen Fielding, I should say, um, and from 1996. So, like um, Tales of the City, um, Bridget Jones was originally a character who appeared in the newspaper. So, it was a, originally a column in, I think, the Independent newspaper in the UK, or might have been The Guardian, one of, one of those slightly left-leaning newspapers anyway. Um, so... I think it's important because not only because, you know, obviously it influenced movies and things like that, that that were based on the books, but because of because of this, the fact that Bridget Jones was um, a, a female character who you could laugh along with. So I think prior to that, um, you know, most of the female characters in um, in books and movies tended to be more serious. So tended to be, um, you know, tended to be there to 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 get the guy. Um, and it was all quite serious and heartfelt and there were there were far less comedies about women, um, which isn't to say, obviously, that there weren't any and that there hadn't been successful, successful you know, female comedians for, for decades. But I think there's a there's a tone to the Bridget Jones books of women, um, female characters being prepared to laugh at themselves, um, which wasn't really present previously. And I think they're very honest about, um, you know, what it's like to be a woman in the modern world as well. So I think those two things have really persisted um, in, um, you know, in, in fiction that is aimed at women um, since the since the success of, of Bridget Jones's diary. OK, next up, this is a book that probably probably won't be a surprise that it's on the list. Um, so Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone by J.K. Rowling. So again, like the Goosebumps books, I think massively important because it in, introduced so many people um, of this age to to reading. Um, sorry, uh, people who are adults now to reading. Um, certainly not people of my age, although I have read the books. Um, you know, clearly J.K. Rowling has become a, a very controversial figure. Um, and I completely get why a lot of people, you know, now are, are turned off her work. Um, but the huge success of the of the Harry Potter books and their influence on children's fiction um, and that, you know, kind of rebirth of, of the love of fantasy and the fantastic um, in children's fiction while also drawing on you know many things so many themes and things like that from from previous decades of children's fiction so you know the kind of the boarding school for example was a mainstay of british children's fiction in like the 50s um, and was something that had fallen out of fashion so i think the harry potter books you know refer back to that that, that previous style of fiction hugely um, but then, you know, throw all the magic and stuff like that in as well. And this idea of having this unfolding, you know, massive story arc, which is incredibly complicated um, and, you know, has a lot of depth to it, I think is something that was, was you know, very unusual in children's fiction before the Harry Potter books. OK, we are nearly there. We've got, I think, six books left. OK, so next up, also from 1997, another, another book, which is the first in a series. So Killing Floor. Um, by Lee Child, which is the first of the Jack Reacher books. And what I think Reacher um, and, and his, you know, the Reacher books have given to popular fiction is this idea, you know, a bit like Jason Bourne, but of the um, of the, the lone hero. So I think in some ways Reacher feels like a cross between the hero of um, the hero of Death Wish um, and Jason Bourne. So he is, you know, this kind of almost superhero type guy. Um, but who is existing in a very normal world um, and he is, you know, works outside of the law, um, but uses his, you know, uses his military skills to get the right outcomes um, for ordinary people. Um, so I think there's a there's a mix of a load of different things at play there. Um, and, you know, Lee Child does it really successfully. 
Um, and if you look on, you know, if you ever look on Kindle Unlimited at thrillers, you will see a ton of books that are totally in the Jack Reacher mould. So there are dozens upon dozens of series of books about lone heroes going across America, finding bad guys and saving, you know, saving innocent people. And I think, you know, Reacher um, is really the influence for those things. Um, and, you know, the success of the series has really, um, you know, has really shaped that that corner of the thriller market um, into what it's like today. OK, next up from 1999, a Japanese novel, uh, Battle Royale by Kojin Takami. Um, so, you know, fantastically, a, a, so a great book, um, a, you know, very dystopian book about, um, well, you, you'll probably know what it's about, so about a class of, of uh, Japanese school kids who are put on, onto an island and have to kill each other. Um, and this is a you know a government sanctioned activity which is which is televised for the entertainment of the of the viewing public um so went on to you know to to spawn a very successful movie as well as a a, a manga series um why is it important well two reasons really so one i think clearly a big influence on the hunger games which you know went on to be an extremely important book in um in y a fiction um, but also, I think that, that the concept of the Battle Royale is now something that is completely embedded in modern society um, because of the video game Fortnite. So, my, you know, my wife plays, plays Fortnite like I read books. She plays Fortnite a lot. And it is, you know, it is a hugely successful game. Um, and it is identical, pretty much, to Battle Royale, apart from the fact that the, you know, the, the characters who play um, in the game are, are not school kids. Um, but, you know, a massively important part of our culture nowadays. And I think many people might turn their noses up at that. Um, but anyone who's got kids under the age of about 12 will know that Fortnite is huge. Um, OK, next up from 2003, uh, The Walking Dead by Robert Kirkman. Um, so, you know, zombies are everywhere at the moment and, and have been for a good few years. And I think the success of the Walking Dead TV series um, and of the comic before that um, is, is a huge part of that. Clearly other things, you know, played a part as well. So some of the later films by, um, by George Romero and also the movie Shaun of the Dead. Um, but I think the Walking Dead um, really reinvigorated the movie genre, uh, sorry, the zombie genre in terms of making it into almost a soap opera so making it about the lives of the people and making it an you know an extended story um that fits so well with the way we do tv nowadays so you know it, in the past the idea of a tv series with you know 20 episodes per season that run for seven or eight seasons would have been unthought of but now it's it's commonplace now um so i think it's kind of a synergy of, of two different things so it's the the comic book form and the tv form coming together um to create something massively popular and successful, which is then bled out into, you know, cinema and things like that as well. So I think, you know, our modern view of zombies um, owes a lot to The Walking Dead. OK, three books left. Um, OK, next up, The Girl with the Drug Tattoo by Stieg Larsson from 2008. So I think, so A, it's, you know, it's a fantastic book anyway. But I think really important because it really got people into the idea of reading books from other countries. So, you know, certainly not the first foreign language book that was very successful in the UK, uh, the UK and, and the US. But um, certainly an, an early book in terms of Scandinavian um, crime fiction, which had a massive boom after that. And, and not just, you know, not just literature as well, but um, TV shows too. So Scandinavian crime is a is huge part of, of the Western European and, and American diet now um, of, of crime. Um, you know, so many of the things that we read and watch are things that have been translated um, from, you know, somewhere in Scandinavia. Um, so many Netflix shows now come from that part of the world. Um, and I think The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, you know, really opened the door for these other people, um, other authors and, and TV creators and things like that to, um, to, to start releasing their stuff into English speaking markets. OK, so next up, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James from 2011. Now, I went on holiday, uh, on, I went on a cruise in, I think it was probably 2015, 2016, something like that. So a few years after the first Fifty Shades book came out. 
and I swear to God, whenever I walked around the swimming pool on the boat, of the people that were reading, every woman was reading um, a Fifty Shades book, and every man was reading a Jack Reacher book. Um, so yeah, you know, Fifty Shades are great, phenomenally successful. Um, interesting because it was originally self-published fan fiction um, that was then picked up by a publisher and just you know blew up from there. Um, but I think really important because it it, it made people feel more comfortable about reading erotic fiction and clearly there was a huge boom in the in the popularity of erotica um after 50 shades came out um but also i think because it you know like um you know like the harry potter books or like the goosebumps books it encouraged people who wouldn't otherwise have read to pick up a book which has got to be a good thing um and in particular i think you know encouraged women to think about their sexuality and to be you know to feel able to talk about it in a way that maybe they hadn't been so willing to before and i'm not saying this about all women but probably you know kind of middle-aged women in particular um i think you know 50 shades was was uh, uh something that, that that opened the conversation a bit um about different types of sexuality and things like that that perhaps had been you know they've been less able to talk about before Okay, the last book. So I have not gone right up to the present day by any means, um, largely because I think with a lot of these things, it takes time for um, for a, a popular work to, to really show that it's had an impact on society. Um, so the last book I'm going to talk about is from 2012, um, and that's Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn. Why do I think that one's important? Well, it really, um, you know, started the modern domestic noir um, genre which is you know whenever you go into a bookshop half of the crime books are books that I think would not be there if not for the success of Gone Girl so you know that that kind of um, thriller that particularly has um, you know a, a female protagonist um, and is a very everyday domestic setting is massively successful now um, and, and I think without Gillian Flynn, you know, it it may not exist in, in the same way that it does now. The other thing that Gone Girl did brilliantly, um, and many subsequent books have, have copied, um, is the idea of having multiple narrators. Now in Gone Girl, I think it makes perfect sense. Uh, I think it was definitely the right choice for that book. In many other books, I think it's a gimmick. Um, I think it's often done for no real reason, um, other perhaps than publishers think it's a good idea. Um, so I think that is a, a negative of God Girl, um, that it is encouraged a particular style of writing that, that I think can be brilliant, but often um, you know doesn't really make sense. Okay, so that was my 30 books that have changed the world of entertainment. Um, do let me know what you think. As I said at the start, I'm sure I've missed a ton of stuff out. You may completely disagree with some of my choices. I'm aware that I have many, many blind spots around, um, you know, different different types of authors. Um, so, you know, this is a very white list. Um, this is a very straight list. This is a, a fairly male dominated list. Um, and, you know, that's because of the kind of books I read. So I'm aware that of those blind spots in my own reading. So please, in the comments or in response videos, you know, talk about the kind of things that you are reading that you think have had an influence as well. Um, as always, let me know what you think. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Something a bit different. I've not done one of these long list videos, um, or I've, I've done a couple of them, but but never one like this. Um, so yeah, I hope it was hope it was interesting. Hope you're all safe and well, and I will speak to you again very soon. Cheerio.